Welcome to the 12th okay, of our um, Mellon Sawyer seminars of the year. Um, this is part of a series um, on democratic citizenship and the recognition of cultural differences. And um, I want to just again acknowledge my co organizers of that series. so-called postmodern left. Uh, so, uh, and Raphael is also the author of uh, a book that uh, I happen to bring with me, 
uh, not yet translated into English, but hopefully that will soon change. Anständig uh, geblieben, which uh, for those of you who uh, don't know German, uh, is an allusion to uh, the notorious uh, Posnan speech of Heinrich uh, Himmler before uh, 70 or so uh, SS men uh, praising their uh, upstanding behavior under conditions of duress. This is where uh, Himmler mentions that this is a praiseworthy chapter of German history that will never be written and cannot be written. And uh, Raphael's book, which is a collection of essays on a number of uh, fascinating issues and fig figures, including uh, Veit Harlan, the director of Jud Zeus, uh, the Martin Walser scandal in the late 90s at the Frankfurter uh, Buschmesse, uh, uh, an essay on the film uh, Untergang or Downfall, uh, et cetera, is a very uh, subtle, thoughtful, and reflective probing uh, of the terms of uh, moral questions in National Socialism and the perversion of morality that resulted. Uh, his, uh, getting out his talk for this afternoon, uh, of course, uh, the 9th of November is a very uh, freighted date in German history. It is the day uh, in uh, 1918 when the uh, Kaiserreich collapsed and the Republic was proclaimed. Uh, five years later, it is the day of uh, Hitler's unsuccessful Munich Beer Hall Putsch, and more recently, it is the day in 1989 of the collapse uh, of the, the fall of the Berlin Wall. But also, uh, perhaps certainly of equal significance, it is the date of uh, Kristallnacht. And Raphael will be uh, presenting a paper on the role of uh, Herschel Grunspan from a forthcoming book uh, on this topic that will be appearing with uh, uh, C.H. Beck Press. And uh, without further ado, and resisting all further temptations, to praise him and comment further on his work. I'm very happy to present to you today, Raphael Gross. Many thanks, uh, uh, Richard, for your very kind uh, words and uh, your uh, maybe a bit too kind introduction, so I now feel timid uh, and hope the expectations aren't too big. Uh, many thanks, uh, Professor Carol Gould, for the invitation to, uh, to both of you. Uh, it's a great honor for me that you've invited me and a great pleasure to be here tonight. Um, and I uh, also want to thank the Mellon Seminar that uh, has uh, been behind uh, the structure behind this series of lectures. I'm very glad uh, that you invited me. Um, I would also uh, like to mention that uh, uh, I, I feel very glad that uh, there is a, a group of um, friends from the Leo Beck Institute New York here present tonight, uh, among them uh, Bernie Bloom, who uh, was the former chairman, uh, in my view, the most successful chairman that the Leo Beck Institute maybe have had, but hopefully there will be uh, equally uh, good ones to come. Uh, and the new director, Billy Weitzer, and uh, Frank Mecklenburg, um, who are both here, so thanks for coming, attending tonight. Um, and I will immediately start uh, to get into uh, my paper now. Um, and I hope you will not be disappointed that I'm not talking about the Kristallnacht, really. I'm really talking about Herschel Greenspan. On November 7, 1938, at the German embassy in Paris, uh, desperate Jewish youth, Herschel Feibel Greenspan, fired five shots at the diplomat Ernst Eduard von Rath. Two of the bullets hit Rath, who died of his wounds soon after. The attack became an excuse for an unprecedented wave of violence against hundreds of thousands of Jews and their apartments, 
businesses and synagogues throughout the German Reich. The pogroms began the same day as the attack and reached their high point on the night of November 9, 10, the so-called Reichskristallnacht. Despite the attack's unpredictable historical significance, neither its precise circumstances nor its background have ever been fully examined. Perhaps precisely because of the historically charged nature of what took place at the German embassy, various descriptions are still circulating around the attack. Is the, is the micro working well? I'm just checking because... Louder, louder please. Yeah, it's good. It's better than that we do it now than, than when you tell me after the talk. It might have been interesting, but we couldn't hear you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Is it now better, yeah? Okay, wonderful. But I'm not going to start again. Perhaps precisely because of the historically charged nature of what took place at the German embassy, various descriptions are still circulating around the attack, its preliminary history and Greenspan's fate. 70 years old at the time, he himself offered different, differing statements. Immediately after the attack, he told French investigators that due to the deportation of his parents and the persecution of Jews, he shot a dirty German, explaining that it isn't enough that the Jews in Germany suffer as they do and are thrown in concentration camps. Now they are being driven out like dogs. The next day he started the following, he stated the following to an investigative judge, I quote, but I would like to emphasize that I acted neither out of hate nor revenge, but for the love of my father and my people who are enduring unheard of suffering. I deeply regret having hurt a human being but I had no other means to express my will. According to these statements, Greenspan's motive was despair and rage at the Nazi measure of disenfranchisement and expulsion. But when in July of 1940, he was extradited by French authorities to Germany, another motive suddenly emerged in conjunction with a new preliminary history. He now asserted that he had had a homosexual relationship with Rath and shot him because of a promise Rath broke to help Greenspan's family in Germany. The change in his explanation is likely to have been tactically based. For Propaganda Minister Goebbels and Foreign Minister von Ribbentrop, an act of revenge in the homosexual milieu of a German embassy would have conceivably been an awkward scenario for the show trial they desired. The Nazis were interested in propagandistically transfiguring Rath into a luminous figure who fell victim to an international Jewish conspiracy. Hence, already on November 8, 1938, Wolfgang Dirwerge, who was active in the propaganda ministry, wrote as follows. The shots fired in the German embassy in Paris will not only signify the beginning of a new attitude in the Jewish question, but hopefully serve as a signal for those foreigners who until now have not realized that in the end only the international Jew interferes with an understanding between nations. From the beginning, the assertion, the assertion of a world Jewish conspiracy stood at the center of Nazi reactions to the attack. By no means, as the suggestion intended, was the attack directed solely against Germany and its increasingly brutal policy towards the Jews. Rather, it represented a world Jewish plot against all non-Jewish peoples. Die Werge tried to back up this thesis in a book he published in 1939, whose title translates as Attack Against Peace, a yellow book about Grünspan and his accomplices. The propagandistic aims of the official Nazi apparatus are thus clear. But who was Herschel Grünspan? 
who following an ordinance issued by Goebbels in 1938 continues to be referred to by many authors as Grünspan, and what did his deed set in motion? Herschel Greenspan came from a Polish Jewish family that lived in Germany from 1911 on. His parents, Sendel and Rivka Greenspan, born Silberberg, fled from Western Russia to escape the Tsarist Empire's pogroms. Following the ratification of Polish independence in the Versailles Treaty, they both assumed Polish citizenship. Herschel Greenspan, the couple's sixth child, was born on March 28, 1921, in Hanover. So he could still be alive. Without ever having possessed German citizenship, his socialization was exclusively German. Three of his siblings died, one at birth, the others as small children from scarlet fever and an automobile accident. Herschel grew up with his sister Esther Beile Bertha and his brother Marcus. Their father worked in Hanover from 1918 on as an independent tailor. During the depression between 1929 and 34, he kept the family above water as a second-hand dealer. At times, the family had also had to live off welfare. In 1935, Herschel Greenspan left his Hanover primary school to become a student at one of the three Torah schools then existing in Frankfurt am Main. The purpose of education in these schools was as the administration put it, to cultivate Talmudic scholarship for the sake of developing communal office officials, assistance at the rabbinate, Talmud teachers, shochtim, that means slaughterers, and cantors who offer a guarantee of a traditional shaping of Jewish life in accordance with Jewish law. In 1935, he also joined the religious Zionist Mizrahi organization. In the summer of 36, he left Nazi Germany. He first stayed with his uncle Wolf Greenspan in Brussels and from there emigrated illegally to France to stay with another uncle, Abraham Greenspan. As is perhaps a suggested motive for his joining the Zionist Mizrahi, Greenspan tried to emigrate to Palestine at least that was his official explanation to the German authorities for his trip to Belgium. He could not find work in either Brussels or Paris, where he also tried fruitlessly to obtain a resident permit. Greenspan's parents and siblings' situation worsened in 1938 because they were not German citizens and were threatened by the loss of their Polish citizenship. Because on March 31 in 38, the Polish parliament passed a law foreseeing the possibility of removing citizenship from Polish citizens that lived outside Poland uninterrupted for more than five years. Thus, as the law stated, no longer have a connection with the Polish nation. The Greenspans, having lived in Germany for decades, thus faced statelessness. The situation worsened for Herschel Greenspan as well. Having no residency permit from April 1st, 1937 on, he no longer retained a valid visa to return to Germany. In addition, his Polish passport lost its validity on February 7, 1938. He lived then as a German, Polish, Jewish, stateless person in Paris without a valid passport, without permission to enter Germany, and without permission to live, in fact, in France. Another stateless person living in the French capital, she had already emigrated from Germany in 1933, was Hannah Arendt. Her German citizenship had been taken away from her in 1937. In May of 1940, she was nevertheless interned in the southern French Gours camp as a hostile foreigner. She was able to escape from the camp after four weeks. In 1943, in her essay, We Refugees, firstly published 
in the American Jewish journal Menorah, Arendt observed sarcastically that modern history had produced a new breed of human being, individuals, I quote, put in concentration camps by their foes and in internment camps by their friends. In her classic work from 1955 on totalitarianism, Arendt forcefully describes the situation of stateless people in Europe during the first half of the 20th century. Analyzing the deprivation of their rights, she shows how the concept of human rights was systematically weakened, emptied out, indeed deprived of meaning through measures of expulsion. In this respect, the expulsions, including in particular the Nazi anti-Semitic expulsions, had a thoroughly planned character. They were aimed at a de-evaluation of human rights and a de-evaluation of the refugees and expelled persons themselves. In 1939, the German Foreign Ministry emphasized in a circular sent to all German posts abroad that at stake was not only being free of the Jews, but also furthering anti-Semitism in the Western countries that had offered the Jews shelters. Germany, the ministry indicated, was also interested in expelling the Jews because this served as the best propaganda for present policies towards them. It was then, and this expressly stated, in the German interest to chase Jews over the border as beggars. For the poorer the immigrants were, the greater the burden they represented for other countries. Following the Munich Agreement on September 30th, 1938, German-Polish relations increasingly worsened. Germany, for instance, demanded the annexation of the free city of Danzig into the German Reich. And Poland feared that the Jews who were living there would be expelled to Poland. The Polish Interior Ministry thus issued a decree aimed at removing Polish citizenship from the Polish Jews living abroad. Polish citizens were required to present their passports at consulates to be controlled. Any, any individual unable to show a control stamp by October 3, 29, 1938, automatically became stateless. And according to international law, Poland could not then be forced to accept these stateless people. The situation for Polish Jews became increasingly perilous. Herschel Greenspan's family was among the 15 to 17,000 Jews arrested in numerous German cities only hours after the expiration of the Polish deadline. From collecting points, they were deported in trains to Benchen on the German-Polish border. At first, the stunned Polish border guards let the train pass. But as soon as the Polish authorities grasped, grasped what was taking place there, they closed the border. Because of this, thousands of deported people found themselves stranded in no man's land, wandering around until they finally found a way into Poland. Herschel Greenspan's parents and siblings initially received shelter in a makeshift barracks camp set up by a Jewish aid committee. Herschel Greenspan learned of his family's fate a few days later, when of November, on November 3rd, a postcard reached him in Paris from his sister Baile, she was then 22, reporting on the deportation. You've certainly heard of our great misfortune. I will describe what happened for you. Thursday evening, rumors circulated that all Polish Jews from one city had been expelled. Nevertheless, we tried hard not to believe it. Thursday evening, at nine o'clock, a police officer came to us and told us that we had to report to the police station with our passports. Just as we were, we all went to the police station accompanied by the police. Nearly our entire district was there already. A police car brought us directly to the city hall. Everyone had been brought there, yet no one told us what was happening but we saw that it was over for us. 
Every one of us was handed an expulsion order. We had to leave Germany before the 29th. We were not allowed to return home. I begged to be allowed to go home to at least get a few things. I then left accompanied by a police officer and packed the most necessary articles of clothing in a suitcase. That's all I was able to save. We don't have a fenning. Later, Baile Greenspan would report the following to her brother. Also, he would only receive this news after the attack. I quote, Friday evening at around 9.30, we we departed from Hanover. There was a lot of screaming and railing. It could have woke a dead, the dead, but our screams didn't help us. Saturday morning, we were released in an open area. The way we were chased through woods and fields was a nerve-wracking spectacle. The sister here described the brutal mass expulsion of Polish Jews from Germany, experienced personally, that was later designated as the Poland Aktion by historians, the Polish action. The news brought tension between Herschel, who it clearly hit very hard, and his uncle Abraham, who was not immediately ready to send money to an unknown place to help his brother's family. Finally, on November 6th, Herschel Greenspan left his uncle with 320 francs in his pocket and rented a room at the Hotel Suez on the Boulevard de Strasbourg under the false name of Heinrich Hallert. Historical accounts of Greenspan's, Greenspan's deed are aligned with one or another of the two differing statements he offered concerning his motive. Did he fire on Ernst von Rath purely coincidentally, or did he deliberately seek him out? What is indisputable is that on November 7, 1938, at around 8.30 in the morning, he purchased a double action revolver and bullets at the weapons store à la fin Lame at the Sharp Blade for 245 francs. At the Duvabien bar in Wolfgang Dierweg's yellow book description, a meeting point for Jewish use, described by other sources as a homosexual locale, as Greenspan sometimes frequented it. He loaded the gun, placed it in his jacket pocket, then set out to the German embassy, 78 Rue Dolil. Having arrived at the building, Greenspan asked policeman for the proper entrance, then entered the embassy at 9.35, exactly the moment the German ambassador, Count Johannes von Welzek left for his morning walk. For this reason, the porter's wife did not show the young man to the ambassador's office, but instead brought him to that of a younger colleague. Since embassy secretary Ernst Achenbach, later responsible for the deportation of Jews to death camps, and then even later speaker of the Free Democratic Party in the post-war period, was late to arrive at work that day. Greenspan was indeed brought to Ernst vom Rath by chance. One of the office helpers, Herr Nagorka, allowed Greenspan an immediate audience without filling out a visitor's form. Such details, likely involving pure coincidence, would become the subject of far-reaching speculation. Was Greenspan admitted because he was already a familiar presence? As already mentioned, two of the five shots Greenspan fired at 9.45 hit Ernst vom Rath. Staggering, he was able to call for help. The assassin then allowed himself to be led away with no resistance by the office helpers, who turned him over to the French police official stationed in front of the embassy, while Achenbach saw to the wounded man. On November 8, Count Welzek reported to Berlin that, I quote, Herr vom Rath was bleeding from two wounds, one of which was in the area of the breastbone, the other in the lower body. He complained of severe pain. I would like to state here in that he bore these pains with great steadfastness and that he had at no time lost his exemplary calm and self-control. 
In reply to a question of Embassy Councillor Breuer as to what led to the attack, he indicated that the perpetrator was a Jew and had explained as he fired that he wished to avenge his co-religionists. Herschel Greenspan had already depicted the context of his deed at the embassy. I was then led into an office and received by an attaché who offered me a chair to his left. He inquired about the reason for my visit. I told him, you are a dirty German, Salbosch, and now I'm going to deliver you a document in the name of 12,000 bullied Jews. I drew the revolver I had hidden in the inside pocket of my jacket and fired. The moment I drew the weapon, the attaché stood up from his chair, but I immediately fired all my bullets. I aimed at the middle of his body. My victim hit me with his fist and left the room calling for help. I remained in the office where I was arrested a few moments later. I received the postcard found in my briefcase on Thursday, and from that moment on, I was determined to kill an embassy member in protest. I knew about my co-religionists' obsession from the papers. Oppression, sorry. Oppression from the papers. That is the only reason for the steps I took. That was Herschel Greenspan's statement immediately after the deed. But as indicated, according to the extent records to, of the additional interrogations, the information he offered was contradictory. In the second hearing, he declared, for instance, that, I quote, I then conceived an act of revenge and protested aimed at the representative of Germany without intending to kill anyone but I wanted to take a spectacular step so that the world would know about it because the German methods make me bitter. He expressed himself similarly in a letter he wrote to his parents while in pre-trial detention. You have probably already heard about me. I ask you forgiveness. I did not intend to kill anyone. I only wanted to protest I would have preferred that this poor person had not died. But unfortunately, he died. Let God, he puts the uh, O in, he doesn't write God, but like an Orthodox Jew, he writes just G, the T. Uh, let God forgive me for what I have done. It was no revenge. I was only done out of my love for you and our suffering brothers and sisters who have to endure injustice simply because they are Jews. In any event, there was never any basis for assuming that Greenspan had any help in planning or carrying out his attack. That was important for the Nazis who wanted to make this into a plot. The 17-year-old was first brought to the juvenile detention center at Fresnes near Paris. On November 9th, 1938, Ernst vom Rath succumbed to his wounds. Also, Goebbels' propaganda apparatus immediately constructed a Jewish conspiracy around the deed. Anti-Semitic violence had already begun on the evening of November 7th in Kassel and the surrounding area. Nazi Germany's Secretary of State, Ernst vom Weizsäcker, arranged a funeral for vom Rath in the German Evangelical Church of Christ in Paris. Afterwards, his body was brought to Düsseldorf in a special train. The state burial for the new and evidently welcome martyr of the Nazi movement took place there on November 17th in the presence of Adolf Hitler and Joachim von Rippentrop. Let us note in passing that despite all propagandistic efforts, Ernst vom Rath, who was born on June 3rd, 1999, in Frankfurt am Main, was not particularly well suited for this martyr's role. Also, he had already joined the Nazi party on July 14, 1932, and the SR in April of 1933. His enthusiasm for national socialism appears to have quickly abated. The reaction to Vom Rath's assassination was 
were varied. In Paris, Herschel, Greens Barnes, manifest wishes notwithstanding, it emphatically did not spark any general solidarity with the Jews whom the Germans were persecuting. On the contrary, numerous anti-Jewish brochures and pamphlets collected by the German authorities show that anti-Semitic gatherings were held at a number of locations. One of the pamphlets called for an anti-Semitism of reason and applauded it spread in increasing circles of French society. A week after the German diplomat's death and the outbreak of violence in Germany on the night of November 9th to 10th, the World Jewish Congress reacted with a declaration that also certainly the deed of the 17-year-old was regretted. The organization wished to also protest that the German press that were holding all of Jewry responsible for the act and that corresponding retaliation acts were being carried out against German Jews. Herschel Greenspan received support from the famous American journalist Dorothy Thompson, who was herself non-Jewish. In a radio broadcast and some of her columns in the New York Herald Tribune, she called for establishing a fund for their use called Give a Man a Chance. By these means, $35,000 were collected for his defense. Thompson was the object of sharp criticism for this in both Germany and France. One anti-Semitic pamphlet commented as follows. This manner of dictating to the French state administration shows an <coughs> impudence that is nothing less than admirable. How about concerning yourself with your Negroes instead? Wie wäre es, wenn sie sich um ihre Neger kümmerten? Also, some people expressed solidarity and understanding for Greenspan. Virtually no one publicly voiced moral approval of his action. One of the few voices that I found to do so was Leo Trotsky, who in early 1939 wrote in the Socialist Appeal newspaper that, from the moral standpoint, and not in respect of his methods of action, Greenspan can serve as a model for every young revolutionary. Following the attack, a preliminary investigation of the Greenspan case began in Paris. Already on November 19, 1938, relatives of Greenspan, following the advice of Jewish organizations, commissioned the caution Vincent de Moreau Jaffrey in his defense. The famous lawyer, anti-fascist, and other French-Jewish socialist premier Pierre Mendes France had already represented David Frankfurter, who on February 4, 1936, had shot and killed the Nazi Landesgruppenleiter, regional group leader Wilhelm Gustloff in Davos. The newspaper, The Angriff, which had ties to the SS, would denounce Moro Geoffrey on the same day as a Jewish advocate on the payroll of the international jury. In the course of the nearly nine months investigation headed by investigating Judge Jean Tessnier, three medical reports were prepared on Greenspan's personality. He was thereby attributed to have an average intelligence and a certain acuteness, as well as the capacity to understand culpability extremely agitated state that overtook him following his family's deportation should not, the doctors indicated, be evaluated as pathological. Nevertheless, what was involved here, they added, was a crime of passion. They suggested an acknowledgement of mitigating factors. From the beginning, the investigation was subject to massive and in part rather successful, German efforts to influence the outcome. Berlin thus sent two special emissaries to be present during the process and represent German interests. The tourist, Professor Friedrich Grimm, and the already mentioned Wolfgang Dieverge. Grimm acted at the direction of the German propaganda ministry and foreign office. During the trial, he would appear as a representative of the accessory prosecution. Hence, for the Fomrat family. Officially, he served as an associate to the French lawyer Maurice Garçon, whom he had chosen together with Mar Maurice 
Blanc-Gol as representative of the accessory prosecution for Ernst von Rath's parents. Wolfgang Dieverge was commissioned at the highest political level, his task being to let the press campaign and present the attack as having been planned well in advance. As already described, Greenspan was declared a tool of international jury, which aimed to poisoning German-French relations, and I quote, at the annihilation, the vernichtung of national socialist Germany. Die Werge had already adopted this strategy following David Frankfurter's attack on Wilhelm Gustloff. That individual was immediately stylized as a martyr of the movement, and Frankfurter as a tool of a pan-Jewish plot to oppress non-Jewish peoples. At the meeting of the German Propaganda Ministry on 11 November 38, the same procedure was decided upon for the Rath Greenspan case. The investigation of the attack was drawn out. As a result of the Nazi expansion policies, for instance, the occupation of Ram Czechoslovakia in March 39, soured German French relations so that the German pressed for a postponement of the trial date. After Germany's attack on Poland on September 1st, 39, the trial planned for autumn was once again postponed. France and Germany were now at war. That the trial was yet again postponed in the autumn was in the end in Germany's best interest, as Greenspan's acquittal was likely due to political circumstances. Herschel Greenspan and his defense team were well aware of this. In a letter to the French justice minister written in late September 39, he requested to serve as a volunteer in the French army. I quote, with my blood, I would like to avenge my wrongdoing, thus atoning for the disagreeable, disagreeable repercussion I caused the land that offered me its hospitality. The request was ejected. Finally, on June 8, the prosecuting authorities in Paris filed accusations of murder against Herschel Greenspan. But it was too late. On June 14, 1940, Paris was occupied by German troops. During the occupation of Paris, the papers of Greenspan's defense landed in the hands of the German secret police. In Orléans, the trial documents were confiscated by German units. While the German power apparatus drew increasingly close to Greenspan, a window of freedom briefly opened for him one last time on June 14, 1940. Following the German march into Paris, the Fresnay Juvenile Detention Center was evacuated. The intention being to transport the young prisoners, including Greenspan, to Orléans. During the trip, the train was bombarded and the guards and prisoners fled. Greenspan and the other prisoners first reported themselves to the Bourges prison, which did not accept them. He then wandered around before showing up at the prison in Toulouse, which did accept him. Greenspan appeared to have preferred French imprisonment over the threat of arrest by the Germans but he presumably did not threaten with the French Justice Ministry notifying the Germans of his location. On July 14, 1940, Greenspan was thus exchanged for the French prosecutor, Paul Ribeir, who was being held as a German prisoner of war and brought to Berlin. This was followed by Gestapo interrogations at the notorious headquarters at Prince Albrechtstraße 8, the confiscated French trial documents had already been moved there. Herschel Greenspan's trial preparations now began in Germany. A giant show trial was planned, had it taken place. It would have certainly been on the same scale as Stalin's show trials. To give Greenspan's deed world political significance, former French Foreign Minister Georges Bonnet, a declared anti-Semite, was to be called as a witness and a date was set for the trial's opening, February 18, 1942. But despite all the energetic planning, nothing really crystallized. In January 1941, Greenspan was sent to the Sachsenhausen concentration camp as a so-called prominent 
prisoner, and the trial was rescheduled for the 11th of May, 1942. But this trial date also came and went in the early summer of 1941, Greenspan was moved to Berlin's Morbid Detention Center. Ernst Lauritz, now preparing charges of murder and high treason that were meant to result with the pronunciation of a death sentence at the Volksgerichtshof, the notorious People's Court presided over by Roland Freisler. The trial had now been rescheduled for the autumn of 1942, but then the preparations were interrupted it appeared on Hitler's personal orders and was never resumed. Hence, just as in France, also in Germany, Herschel Greenspan never stood trial. Probably plans to present the attack as a deliberate assault by world jury on German Aryan existence were deemed too problematic because of the possibility that Greenspan could declare at trial that he had served the homosexual Ernst vom Rath as a hostler or procured hostlers for him. At that point, since no trial was to take place, at least during the war, in the summer of 42, Greenspan was sent to Sachsenhausen, where all the records of his existence disappeared. Fellow prisoners claimed they saw him in August of 1942 for the last time. Following the deportation, Greenspan's parents and his siblings, Marcus and Bertha, were able to flee to Russia in November 38. They survived the Holocaust there. Marcus Greenspan served in the Red Army. The last sign they had of Herschel was a Red Cross letter sent in 1940. After the war, they searched fruitlessly for him for many years. During the post-war period, the discussion of Herschel Greenspan's fate never completely died down. In 1957, the historian Helmut Heiber suggested in the prominent German quarterly of modern history, the Vierteljahrshefte für Zeitgeschichte, that Greenspan was living in Paris under a false name, a rumor that would then repeatedly surface in various forms. There was already a sequel to the, German case, to the Greenspan case in 1953, when Michael Graf Soltikow, a journalist for Glossy Magazines, who claimed to have been active for the German resistance during the war, declared in two articles he wrote for the Nuremberg Magazine Wochenend that Greenspan and von Rath had indeed had a sexual relationship and that Greenspan's homosexuality was the reason he stayed in hiding after the war. The von Rath family was extremely annoyed by these assertions. The former Wright family was extremely annoyed by these assertions. The brother of the assassinated man, the lawyer Günther von Rath, sued Soltiko for defamation. We should keep in mind that in 1950s Germany, homosexuality was not only considered a moral offense, but was, as in the United States, because of state sodomy laws, a punishable act. During the course of the trial, which took place before the Munich District Court in 1916, Wolfgang Die re-emerged on the scene. Under oath, he declared that he only heard of a motive for the attack based on a sexual relationship between Rath and Greenspan later on, and that at the time of his involvement, he personally knew of nothing in that respect. He also stated, under oath, that he had never been aware of any connection between Nazi persecution of the Jews or plans for a show trial of Greenspan's case. This was manifestly a lie and had its own sequel. In 1966, the District Court of Essen opened its own proceeding against Wolfgang Dieverge, charging him with perjury Soltikov took the stand in this trial as well and maintained to be in contact with Herschel Greenspan through a middleman, something that could never be verified and that was most likely a lie too. Die Verge 
was in any case sentenced to a year in jail on account, on account of perjury. This leading anti-Semitic propagandist in Goebbels' ministry, who like many other high-ranked Nazi functionaries had found his home in the Free Democratic Party after the war, and even wrote the central training material for the party's election speakers, was thus meant to be held accountable for at least this one small thing. But the sentence was later suspended. In the 1960s, the Attorney General of Hesse, Fritz Bauer, tried to have Die Verge charged with being an accessory to mass murder. But here again, the investigation led to nothing. The proceedings having ended in November 1969 on the grounds that Greenspan's show trial never took place. The question of whether or not Greenspan had died or indeed still lived, as Helmut Heiber and other German historians asserted, without ever showing any evidence for this, played a role in another context. The request by Greenspan's father to the West German government for reparations money for his son's death. In order to even apply for such reparations to the government authorities or the United Restitution Organization, a death certificate was necessary. 15 years after the end of the war, on November 13, 1960, a German judicial inspector in Hanover, Greenspan's birthplace, certified the death of the missing person Herschel Greenspan and fixed the date of death as May 8, 1945. His family could now benefit from the fact that neither France nor Germany had ever sentenced him. The reparation application could simply indicate that he must have been killed by Nazi persecution. During the Eichmann trial, Sendel Greenspan testified to his endless, fruitless effort to locate his son Herschel after the war. His testimony, given on April 25, 1961, moved many observers, including Hannah Arendt, who was present as a reporter, as you know, for The New Yorker. In her article series, an eventually highly controversial book, Eichmann in Jerusalem, she wrote, he was an old man, wearing the traditional Jewish skull cape, small, very frail, with sparse white hair and a beard, holding himself quite erect. Now he had come to tell his story, carefully answering questions put to him by the prosecutor. He spoke clearly and firmly, without embroidery, using a minimum of words. Sandel Greenspan reported how he and his family, who at the time had lived in Germany for almost three decades, had been deported during the Polish action. The story took no more than perhaps 10 minutes to tell. When, and when it was over, the senseless, needless destruction of 27 years in less than 24 hours, one thought foolishly, Everyone, everyone should have his day in court. Only to find out in the endless sessions that followed, or in continues, how difficult it was to tell the story, that at least outside the transforming realm of poetry, it needed a purity of soul, an unmirrored, unreflected innocence of heart and mind that only the righteous possesses. No one either before or after was to equal the shining honesty of Sindel Greenspan. It was no doubt a coincidence, but after the testimony, it only took a little more than a year until on May 3rd, 1962, for the district president of Hanover to approve of the reparations of 8,550 German mar marks to Herschel Greenspan's heirs for their son's loss of liberty due to persecution. In the Lower Saxony State Archives, there is documented correspondence lasting years between Herschel Greenspan's parents and the reparation authorities in Hanover who appeared to bureaucratically delay and delay further reparations as long as possible. 
For a long time, the general judgment passed on Herschel Green's barn, and I'm coming to the end, was very negative, especially from Jewish commentators. In 1938, the fear was great and only all too justified that the Nazis would exploit his deed. This perspective hardened. Hannah Arendt, for example, wrote as follows. Herschel Greenspan was a psychopath, unable to finish school, who for years had knocked about Paris and Brussels, being expelled from both places. Quote. As his letters show, in detention, Greenspan suffered from the reproach that he bore responsibility for the pogroms of November 38. Other voices were only gradually heard. Still during the war, the English composer Michael Tippett dedicated an oratory to the attacker entitled A Child of Our Time, its first performance being held in London in 1944. And while in the post-war period, German historians often relatively uncritically followed the tracks laid by Diverge, by Grimm, and other Nazi representatives, depicting Herschel as a loitering Jews from the Jewish underclass in the early 1980s, the Swiss historian Klaus Urner placed him in the proper context of the very small group of courageous loners who placed their lives at risk and stood up to the Nazis. Urner also refers to the already mentioned David Frankfurter and to Georg Elser, the carpenter who tried to kill Hitler. Gerald Schwab, Greenspan's biographer, who himself fled Germany as a child, brought Greenspan's fate together with another person, the Czech artist Stefan Lux. On July 3rd, 1936, during a general assembly of the League of Nations, Lux took his life directly before the gathered plenum to draw attention to the persecution of the Jews by the German Reich. He uttered some no longer extant words, then shot himself with a revolver. Buried in the Jewish cemetery in Geneva, he and his deed were quickly forgotten. What Herschel Greenspan did thus neither stands alone, as it was preceded by several other attacks on German representatives, nor were the Nazi mass crimes declared a reaction to it executed out of the blue. With his action, Greenspan was reacting to the brutal and wicked measure carried out by the Nazi state. He had as little success with the action as did those other individuals who tried through desperate measures to wake up the free world. For the most part, contemporaries had little or no appreciation for their deeds. And the same can be said for historians. Despite the many years since the atta his attack on von Rat, whether Herschel Greenspan was a child of his time, a disturbed young man, a murderer acting for personal reasons, or a hero, continues to be judged in very different ways. In any event, he belongs to the many human beings rendered stateless who, as Anna Arendt put it, were declared the dregs of mankind and whose fate continues to be of acute concern in view of the expulsions that are continuing today. Thank you.